guys, what's up? Welcome to week four of audio production techniques. We got a lot of stuff in store for us this evening. Um, just want to give a quick hello to everybody that's joined us tonight. I appreciate you guys taking the time out to come hang out with us this evening. Um, again, we've got a lot of stuff that we're going to cover this evening. The song that you just heard uh, were files that were taken from the website in Daba. So uh, for those of you that have joined us each of the, each week, uh, the next five, maybe ten minutes, I'm just going to quickly run through where I've got these materials from. In the uh, event that you haven't joined us in the past or you haven't seen any of the archives, this will kind of give you a quick update. And of course, I won't be able to take you through everything we've done to the session, but uh, again, those archives are there for you. But still want to show you where we get the materials from. Before we get started today, does anybody have any questions right off the bat? Cool, cool, awesome. Okay, if there's no questions, let's see here. Ruben, uh, that's a very good question. You're asking about how do we get the uh, grid to line up. Actually, I'll show you that information. Let's uh, flip over to the Indaba website real quick. Here is Indaba Music. This is where you guys are going to get your files from. Yeah, and you're asking for the link to Indaba. It's indabamusic.com. There's a link for you guys. So once you go to this website, you want to create a free account. A uh, free account is going to give you three opportunities to download some of these files. So what are the files that you're downloading? They're basically session files from their master recordings. And they're giving them to you because they want you to do a remix. So uh, the final project, you guys can see, we don't have a Pro Tools assignment. So you don't have a video screen capture to turn in this week. You're just going to have the final project. So you'll have your final exam, which will basically be a 50-question test, multiple choice, open book. So be aware of that. You'll want to watch the lecture, which is a required two-hour viewing. Half the information is taken from your book. The other half is taken from the lecture. So that's how you're going to do well on that multiple choice question. The other thing that you'll have to turn in on Sunday will be this final project. So here we are at Indaba. Once you sign up for a free account, the free account gives you three opportunities. So you want to go to the Opportunities tab. When you go to the Opportunities tab, it's basically going to give you a listing of the artist's files that are available for you to use. Now remember, you only have three opportunities, so you can only pick from three of these artists. So if we scroll across, you can see there's a banner here. I don't like to use this banner because it basically just rotates through, but here's all the same ones. If we look down here, now notice it says submit for, for a licensing deal. You don't want that. You want to look at one like this right here. See how it says remix games that we play? So if I wanted to get these files, let's go listen to it first before we enter the opportunity because I would hate to go and enter the opportunity only to find out I hate the song. So let's listen to it first because you're going to be working on this for quite a while. So we'll go ahead and we'll hit the play icon. You'll see a little uh, <clears throat> a media player launches at the bottom, which we'll go ahead and play the song. She go for the OV in the back to the bands, low key. They play my new shit like ODs, me shades on to see the world lead. Dry slow like the car run on Cody. All right, cool. You got an idea what the song's about. Now, I'm actually not using this song, but I just want to show you guys what you would need to do. So if you pick the song, you like the song, you're going to enter the opportunity. Remember before you start spending these, though, that you only have three of these. So you want to listen to the song first and make sure it's material you want to work with. It would be kind of wasteful for you to use one of your three free opportunities if you really didn't like the song. So once you've chosen the song, we'll go ahead and enter the opportunity. You'll see here there's a bunch of legal jargon, which basically is just saying they're going to sue the living daylights out of you if you try to sell this in any way because the actual original copyright belongs to the original artist. So once we select accept and continue, this is where it kind of gets serious because here's a page that once you leave this page, you cannot get back to this page. You're going to want to download all the stems. And then I believe it was, oh, a student asked me about the grid. Let's see. That was Ruben. Okay. Ruben, your question is good because your question actually deals with a section that's under FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. If you notice under Frequently Asked Questions, if you scroll down here, they're going to give you a question here. Let's see, what tempo is games that we play and what key is it in? These are really crucial pieces of information. So games that we play is in the key of F sharp minor with a tempo or a beats per minute BPM of 104 beats per minute. So when you get into Pro Tools, you need to make sure that the beginning of your session is set to be 104 beats per minute. And that should take care of your grid for the entire session. Now that's going to be important because all the editing that you want to do, you want it to be the grid. That way it's real easy to take apart the song and put it back together. So a uh, good question right off the bat. That's going to be a very important piece of information. Now if you're not really sure how to get the tempo, uh, Ruben's saying, let's see, I did that 
was off with California Dreaming. Let me go back and take a look. I think I might have already downloaded these files. Let me, let me go back. I think my download manager is already downloading that other artist. It is. Cool. Let me go see if I can find California Dreaming. One moment while my browser refreshes. Let's just go opportunities. Let's see. Okay, it looks like I already have these files. Let me see here. So we're gonna look under FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. <clears throat> okay, what tempo is uh, Dreaming California and what key is it? Dreaming California is in the key of E flat minor at 89 beats per minute. So let's take a look. Uh, let's, it looks like I've already downloaded these. Let me see if, uh, if I've already got it here for you. Let me go ahead and close the session. And let me see if I got it already downloaded. Open downloads. Let me see if I put it. Now, let me show you what I do with these files. If you look in your music folder, there's a couple different locations I've done here. There's some uh, remix loops that you're going to put inside of um, your sounds and samples folder. Avid materials. So you'll see that I'm going to be pulling from these loops. It's eight and a half gigs worth of materials you guys can get from DigiDesign. I'll show you that here in a second. Uh, but let's take a look under Artist Remix Files. Hmm, it looks like I may have downloaded these files, but now thrown them away. Let me go back and take a look at the name of the artist again. I'm not sure if I have these files anymore. Oh, Drop City Yacht Club. Let's go back and see if I can find that then. There we go. Right there in front of me. Drop City Yacht Club. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this then. I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and create a brand new uh, Pro Tools folder. So I'll go to Pro Tools, create a new session, Command N. Broadcast Wave sounds good, 44.1. No problems. Let's set up for Stereo Mixed. And uh, while I'm here, let's go ahead and copy this information because when I go to create this new session, it's going to be named the same thing. So I might as well save myself a step, Command C to copy. We go to create this new session. We'll save it back into my music folder. I've already created a Pro Tools folder, so we'll save it inside my Pro Tools folder. And then we'll give it the name, Command V to name it. So here we go. We'll save it. Uh, we'll go ahead and replace it. And then I'll go ahead and create this session. Replace. I tell you what, let's call it O2 then. See, it seems like I've already got that session there. Let's give it a slightly different name. Cool. Let's go import the file. Shift Command I. We'll go back to our artist remix files, and it's Drop City Yacht Club. Open up the folder. Here's all the files. We'll go ahead and select them all. Go ahead and copy them all. Hit done. We'll import them into the session, and let's take a look and see why you're having difficulties getting it to line up. Ruben's asking, should you work off a separate drive? Uh, yeah, if you're working a whole bunch on stuff, I'm currently working off my laptop's drive. It's not really advisable to do this. Uh, I'm really kind of overtaxing the drive. The operating system is having to run in the background. Pro Tools is having to run. So I'm really kind of taxing this drive. Um, typically, like, if I'm going to be working on a professional project, yeah, I want to get a FireWire drive, and I want to work off of that drive. For today's example, I'm actually working off the internal drive. We're going to go ahead and import all these tracks into brand new tracks. Get all the files into brand new tracks. You can see Pro Tools is now rendering the waveform. Awesome. Coolio. They're all there. Files are all there. Let's take a look now. So it's saying that the uh, session should have been 89 beats per minute. Well, Pro Tools defaults to its original tempo of 120 beats per minute, which creates a problem. If we go ahead and create a click, a click track, so we go to track, create click track, you'll hear this right off the bat. So I'm going to solo out the drums with our click track. That way you can actually hear what's going to be going wrong with this. Let's take a look at our click track. Solo that as well. Uh, solo saved. Turn it up. And you're going to hear these, this is going to be off pretty, pretty majorly. Yeah, it's a complete mess. And that's because the grid doesn't match the actual drums. We actually hide all tracks. We look at the drums track. Hey, take a look. Notice my grid's not showing right now. 
I'm in bars and beats. If I double click, notice the grid will show up. So there is the timeline at the top. It shows me my main time scale set for bars and beats. If your grid goes away, just click on the main time scale again and you'll notice your grid will show up somewhat translucent behind the waveforms. And notice the grid does not line up. So whenever we're hearing this played back, you're hearing it out of sequence with the actual tempo. <laughs> Doesn't sound right at all. Let's go ahead and change the tempo. I'm going to hold control, go to the actual tempo field. If you don't see this tempo field in your ruler up top, that means you need to add this item. Notice here we can just show just the main ruler. And that makes the tempo go away. So you want to see the actual tempo ruler. We'll control click on it. When you control click on it, it allows you to alter the tempo. We'll put in 89 beats per minute. Now, this actually should fix it, but let's go ahead and listen. It, um, Ruben, you might be right. It might actually creep away for, for a bit. So, in fact, I'm looking at it, and it looks like it's already ahead of the grid uh, just from the start. We'll be able to hear this as an auditory example as well. So, let's take a listen. <laughs> Yeah, so it's close, but it's not dead on, Ruben, so you're right. It's it's not going to follow. In fact, it's going to get worse the further the song goes along. So if we actually go listen to the very end of the song, you're going to hear that this is going to be super sloppy. <laughs> Completely off. So what should we do to fix this? Well, there's a couple things we could actually do. Number one, what I'd actually do is I'd, I'd question their tempo. I'd question their tempo by actually going in here and taking a look. And I can actually see right away that it's off slightly. So what am I going to do? I'm actually going to use Tab to Transient, which is this feature right up top. I've got a blue little halo, and it looks like an arrow pointing to a drum transient. And what this does, if I put myself in slip mode here and just kind of show you, if I hit Tab, notice it's going to tab along to every single drum transient. Now if I hold down Option to hit Tab, it's going to go backwards on the transient. If I hold Shift and Tab, it's going to actually make a selection. So if we make a selection here, and let's put ourselves back into bars and beats for our main time scale. And from starting at this point right here, so if we tab up to the main beat and I say, well, I want it to be one bar. So I have a one bar selection. You can see the front of the selection and the back of the selection here just by hitting your front and back arrows, which is nice because then we can see, look, it's actually already off a little bit. So I don't really, I'm not going to trust in their tempo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold shift and I'm going to tab up to get right to this drum transient. And I'm going to go back and actually listen to this and loop playback. So let's show our transport up top. I don't think the transport show. showing. Now I can see loop playback is already engaged, so I want to listen to this without the click track on. So let's disengage the click, which is uh, Merrick key 7 to engage or disengage. And let's just listen to this and make sure that this loops accurately. And if it loops accurately, then this is really what the tempo should be. So let's listen. Okay, and it is. It's dead on. That's a good loop. But notice here Pro Tools has it off slightly. It says it's one bar with 52 ticks. I know it's not going to be 52 ticks. My ear is correct. So something's going on with the tempo here. Let's correct it. What can I use to actually tell Pro Tools? Since Pro Tools doesn't have the exact tempo, there's a feature that I showed you guys in it was either week one or week two that would actually show you how to get an exact tempo for a selection. Yeah, Paul, nice one. Identify beat. Uh, identify beat, command I is the quick key. But if you don't remember the quick key, that's okay. Just realize it's under the event menu. And here we go. We have identify beat. Now, what does Identify Beat do? Well, it pulls up this window, and notice here that it says, okay, this starts at bar 7, beat 4, with 831 ticks. I tell you what, that's pretty close to bar 8. So I think the beginning should be 8. shouldn't be bar 7, beat 4. It should be bar 8. So we'll go ahead and we'll say if that's 8. And if I have a one-bar selection, what would my endpoint be? So I only have one bar selected. It starts at bar 8. What would the endpoint be? Bar 9, beat 1. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're telling Pro Tools that it's wrong with its grid. So if we say bar 9, beat 1, and hit OK, notice Pro Tools' grid just corrected itself. You can see now it's on the downbeat of, of every uh, hit of the drum. So if we go back and we listen to our click track now, turn it on, get the little metronome symbol turned on, we listen now to the click track with, uh, with our new tempo, which notice it's 87.8224, and it corrected itself. Now, it should sound right here, but we're going to want to go and listen to the end of the song, because if it's wrong, it's going to creep away at the end of the song. Let's listen from the beginning, just see what it sounds like.
okay, notice it's already gone out of tempo. That lets me know that whoever programmed this didn't actually use a rigid grid. And this is actually giving me a real pain for you guys to work on as a project because what you would have to do is you would have to do that identify beat process, but you would have to do it all the way down the grid because basically there are small tempo changes that are going on throughout this song. So what do I mean by that? Well, we started here with bar one. Well, we would need to pick up here with this bar one and basically say, okay, if it starts here, let's put in another bar increment to make a selection. Now we're looking at the beginning and end points and look at, you can already see it's off. So what do we need to do? We need to back this up a little bit. We're in slip, so I'll hold shift and back this up and then hold shift tab. And now if I look at this option F, so I can see the beginning and end points, this is where I'd want to correct the grid again. So command I for identify B. It starts at bar nine, but not with three ticks. That would need to be bar nine on the downbeat. So bar nine, no ticks. And if it's one bar long, what should the end point be? Yeah, it should be 10. Now, if we look here, there's a subtle temp tempo change that's happening in between these two sections here, even from bar one to bar two. So basically, this song, in order for you to lock this up, you're going to have to go down bar by bar and correct the grid all the way down the song. Notice we're at 87 beats per minute, and then we're at 89 beats per minute. That lets me know that this was not a quantized groove. So what I'd really uh, honestly tell you to do is probably pick another song because... The process that I just showed you, that's pretty arduous. Could you do it? Yeah. It's probably going to take you about 45 minutes just to get the tempo mapped for the entire song. Yeah, it is, it is painful, but it's very, very accurate once you lock it up the way I just showed you in that method because you're, you're getting very, very exact tempos. Of course, we'd need to pick it up right where we left off, so we're in grid mode. Start at bar 10, hold shift and tab till we get up to that next beat, and then we need to do a command I again. Yeah, bar 10 beat 1, cool, but it shouldn't end at 10-4 with 940 ticks. It should end at bar 11. Notice here we went from 89.7466, uh, I'm sorry, 87.7466, 89.2231, 89.6949. So this is going to be deadly, deadly accurate, but it's also just going to be a pain. By the way, this is how rock songs happen, because a lot of rock songs are basically recorded not to a click track. They're just following the drummer. The drummer is naturally going to have some swing. During the verses where he's explaining the song, they're usually going to slow down just a little bit. And then when you get to the actual chorus or the meaning of the song, it has more intensity. And many times the drummer will speed up. So in this case, I know it sounds like a drum machine, but it sounds like they actually programmed this one maybe on an MPC or something that did not have a fixed quantized uh, groove. So just understand that this is going to be an arduous process, but that kind of gave you a, a stepping point. All right, cool. What I want to do is I actually want to um, jump out of here and let's go back into the project. I want to go back and we played the song from beginning to end at the beginning of our session, but I want us to actually go back and catch up with some of the work we did to this song. So let's go back. Let's go to open recent file, open recent. Uh, let's actually just go to open session. We'll go back and find that session. It's in my Pro Tools folder. She Wants Revenge was the name of the song. And we got up to version six. So we were actually working on the baseline. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, Ruben, no problem. Very good question, by the way. And uh, for anybody else that was picking that song, they were probably driving themselves crazy wondering why the actual tempo didn't line up. And that, that lets you know exactly. So e excellent question. <clears throat> now, last time we left off, we recorded down our, my baseline to audio. So. So we've got a little bass line groove going. Let's actually listen to the entire song and see what we've got so far. I was basically mimicking their bass line, and we've gotten a little ways here, but we're going to have to carry this a little bit further. So now I'm, I'm going to have to go and repeat myself out with the bass line, listen to their bass line. We basically just mimicked it with MIDI, and that way we actually have a pattern to use for uh, recording all this down. I'm going to go ahead and delete the audio that we have here. We're going to record that down a little bit later. Um, to hear this, we're going to need to actually hear the output, so we're going to need to go out of a physical output. Excellent. And uh, let's actually pull up the bass as well, because this is what we were mimicking. Um, and let's just kind of see where we're at with the song so far. Um, again, we're just going to take a look and see what, what we've got so far. We've added in some percussion. Today we're going to nail down some mixing. Uh, we're basically just trying to wrap up this project. I want to show you a couple uh, new little goodies dealing with time-based routing that I want you guys to know that you'll be expected to do on your project. I want to show you guys some automation 
And we're going to deal a little bit more with MIDI and how to get MIDI converted over into audio. But let's take a quick listen and see what we've got so far. Uh, baseline, we're going to go ahead and open that back up. And let's just listen to what we got. <laughs> So we've got our percussion in. Uh, I'll probably go and beef up that percussion. And there's some parts that I think are lacking that we could really give it a little bit more humph. What I really want to pay attention to for right now so we can kind of track this out is this bass line. Uh, notice it, it sounded like the bass was going to repeat itself, but it looks like another change up happens here. So if we actually just listen to these two together. We'll solo them both out and we can listen to them. So right here, there's a change up. It's actually going up. So it looks like it's going to be this section here. So I'm going to go ahead and separate that. And since I know it's going up right there, I might as well go ahead and use that section. So this whole section right here, we're going to use it because I heard it go up right there. Bingo, bango, bongo. That should fix this whole section. Actually, if we go ahead and count these measures here, I think if we just grab this as an eight bar measure, I think this is basically going to be the re repetition here. So if I duplicate this and we go and listen to it, it should kind of pick right back up here. And notice here it's following along with these sections here. So we've got the verse, verse, and this should be basically dead on. We'll go ahead and listen. So it looks like the section goes higher here. I'm just going to copy it over again, duplicate it. And it goes up again, so that section doesn't belong there. This goes there. So basically, I'm just following the notes. I'm listening for the pitch level. I notice it's going higher, so I can see my MIDI notes are higher. Edgar asked, does all the MIDI have to be recorded to audio? No, it doesn't have to be, but if you're going to use a virtual instrument that is not within Pro Tools, so if you're using something from native instruments, go ahead and please record that down, because I'm not going to have that instrument, and uh, I won't be able to hear it. So I want to be able to hear what it is that you guys have done original to your composition. Um, looks like we have a pretty good idea of what's going to go on here. Notice here I have a good idea what's happening through the verse sections. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to take this and option drag it because there's a verse there. There's a verse there. And hopefully I'm just guessing that, uh, that it doesn't change from verse to verse. And I see I have pre-chorus here. I'm, I'm going to have to listen for what we have there. But I notice I have pre-chorus here as well. So I might as well option drag this. So it looks like these are going to be probably the same sections. Um, again, I'll have to listen for what's in this gap. We'll go ahead and copy this verse here, Command-C. 
and we'll go find our next verse. I'll tell you what it looks like we're going to have to listen to some of this. So. Something changed there. Let's go back and listen because something was definitely there's some conflicting notes within this section. So I'm going to have to go back and actually listen to it. And it's this section right here where the notes are fighting. So I believe I just missed the mark as far as where these notes should be. Let's go ahead and listen. Uh, it goes down instead of going back up for this section. So let's go back, change it to notes view. And these are the only notes we have to move. I'm actually going to change my grid resolution. This will help keep them in place. And we'll listen to it. And I believe that's the note we were missing. And I'm off by a half step. There we go. It looks like this little section here. So I'm just brushing up on this bass real quick. We'll be done with this in just a second. Duplicate that over. This guy right here goes here. So Command C, Command V, goes back down instead of going back up. through this bridge section it changes up pretty drastically so I'm gonna have to start moving around these notes I'm hearing definitely some conflicting notes pretty much right away these this little section here sounds like it's right but we're we're walking into some some hairy notes through here so we're gonna to need to change this back over notice I'm dealing with my MIDI regions as regions or I'm sorry as clips and if you want to actually edit the individual notes you'll have to be in notes view so let's go back and just listen I'm hearing some some pretty nastiness right through here In fact, it sounds like he actually changes, changes up the actual pattern of his playing slightly, too. Let's see. Yeah, a couple of these notes are actually held longer instead of there being double notes. So I'm going to change this up slightly by going in and taking a look at my grid resolution. And let's change up some of the links of these notes. <clears throat> And again, I'm just doing this based off of ear. I can see that that note shouldn't even be there. This one gets held out longer. And I'm just looking at the actual waveform here to match these guys up. Goes up right here. And again, just following along, I, I'm, I'm not uh, professed to be a, a musician. I'm more of an engineer. I'm just listening to the original performance and then matching it here 
basically note for note. And I'm going to have to change up some of the positioning of some of these notes again right here, but let's just listen to make sure we've got the right pitch. So right pitch, let's change up some of the actual placement of these notes, the length of them. That one can go away because this one just needs to be held a little bit longer. Same thing with this one. And I think it actually even goes higher in this next section. <clears throat> if you're, if, I don't know if this is translating very well because it's probably really difficult for you guys to hear bass frequencies coming through my speaker here. But let's just listen. So these notes basically are the same exact note, just a slightly different pattern again. Pull them up, and let's zoom in on these. Yeah, that note is definitely going to be held a little bit longer. Oops, let's not do that. Just the individual note itself. And definitely held a lot longer on this note. duplicate that over and I'll show you why. We're just going to move it up to where it should be. And of course, we're, this is all messed up. Let's take a listen here. This goes back down to the original note, so we can go ahead and duplicate this over, Command D, and just bring it back down to where it should be. And hopefully that just repeats itself. Let's give it a quick listen and make sure. So a lot of this is just really finding the note and then repeating those patterns. do notice here it just repeats itself let's go back over here and switch to clips because if we go back and we look at one bar increments I'm just going to be able to copy and paste this over actually let's do it in four bar duplicate it, it should be basically the same thing actually did hear that I want to change on the, this pattern is the very last note it sounds like he's actually pulling this note down to bend it back up so and this actually helps it return back up to the uh, original root note go ahead and throw it back over in a 16th note I know this is arduous guys but uh, let's uh, just nail this down real quick once we've done it once we can just I believe it was just that one note that helps it return back up. Yeah, definitely. That kind of helps it out. So what we're going to do, again, go back into clips, because I'm just going to duplicate that over. Notice I'm going to pick up here and just duplicate over. That way I don't have to place each of those individual notes there. It's going to do it for me. And then let's see where the rest of the song goes, and we're almost done. So it went up. It looks like it's going to be this section here. Actually, it's this one. Command C, Command V.
break here for the outro. It's going to be this one. It goes back down. Command C, Command V. And this guy goes away for a bit. And it looks like there's an extra note here. A couple extra notes. We'll just use the old trim tool. And just trim this region down. Excellent. And then it looks like we're going to pick right back up with our original base piece. Command C, one bar increments. <clears throat> Command V to paste. Looks like it goes up almost immediately, which so it's going to be this section here. I'm going to separate it, just grab it, and move it over. Again, and I think we're done. I think that's going to be it. Let's just listen to this last section and we're done with the bass. Totally done. The bass line's absolutely, exactly, basically note for note what the original bass line is. So I'm going to go ahead and save my work now. Let's do a save session as, and I'll show you why. Uh, the, our last one was version six. We're going to make this version seven. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and delete the bass line, the original bass line. But uh, this is not an, an undoable feature, so that's why I did a save as. We'll go ahead and delete this. We no longer need their original baseline because we have their baseline captured. Now, one thing I want to show you that's really cool, let's go ahead and label this base, is that I can now change this to be any sound I want. I already have their pattern. So if we take a look, triple click on the track, it selected everything on the track. Now that I have their baseline, I can just roll through any patch to change it to be whatever I want. So we can just go up and down. Now, these are actually trying to sound like natural basses, but what I think might really be good is putting in a synth bass. Instead of having a natural bass sound, let's take a listen. jumps out. Let's take a listen and see what that sounds like actually in the song itself. That's a really punchy bass. And all I did was just rotate through different presets, just trying to find something that would sound kind of like the original, but maybe given a, a totally different twist. So if we go ahead and listen to that with the track. <laughs> Thank you. 
now, now that we've got this uh, already dialed in, we can basically move on. And you're going to want to repeat basically the same thing for each of the items that are in the song. So we, we did the, we basically mimicked what we heard from the bass line and replaced it with our own bass. You want to do that with any of the other parts that you hear there, like the guitar part. Um, you don't have to play the exact guitar part with, uh, with MIDI notes. You can basically follow along, anything that would fall along within the key is fair game. So I want you guys to be creative with this and just basically have a good time with it. Does anybody, uh, does everybody understand what you just saw me do as far as listening along with the bass line, finding the correct notes and following the pattern. And then that allows you, now that you have the pattern, to basically go and apply whatever sound you want to the same exact MIDI pattern. Is everybody good with that? Anybody have any questions with that so far? Quick pause to see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, cool. So, hey, uh, let me show you one other thing that before we commit this down to audio, let me show you something else. Now, we used Expand, which you guys all have. So, I used Expand, but let's throw away Expand or try a different virtual instrument. For instance, you guys also have this thing called Vacuum. And Vacuum basically, um, Vacuum is basically going to be like an analog synthesizer. So, let's go and find maybe a bass sound through Vacuum and, uh, See if we find something even cooler than what we just came up with. We'll go ahead and solo out the bass line. I'm going to go in here and look under their bass patches. We'll start off here. And again, I have no idea whether it's going to be killer or it's going to be terrible. I'm just trying random patches because a lot of times your, your head will get stuck on a certain sound. And while that might, might be a really cool sound, sometimes just rotating through the same exact MIDI pattern but applying a different sound to it will then open up the other sonic possibilities that, uh, that you may not even be aware of. So let's go ahead and listen to this. And again, I'm just going to rotate through patches. Now that I went to the base section, I'm just using this little plus icon so I can rotate through the different patches. And it's basically just going to move me along through the different patches here without me having to navigate through this menu. So we'll just give it a quick listen, see if we find something that we think is even cooler than what we came up with. Okay, I didn't find any happy actions in that one, so we're going to revert back. Let's go back to Expand. Not a big deal. We just rotated through the patches of Expand anyways. So here's Expand. We went to their synth bass section. And it wasn't very long before I came up with, I, I, I apologize, but I forget which patch, so I'll have to just rotate through real quick. Sounds pretty good. I like that. Um, let's take a look. If I want to actually get rid of some of the actual filter, we'll go ahead and select A because this is the growler. And notice now we have cutoff. 
just basically closed it up just a little bit. Made a little bit more bass-like, so we get a little bit, uh, get rid of some of the uh, attack. Makes it a little bit more hollow, gets rid of some of the thump of what you would normally hear. And uh, so there's your cutoff, your filter decay, and your envelope mod. All right, now I kind of like what I already got. It's now time to commit it to audio. Let me do this now. Let's turn it over to you guys. What would I do if I want to actually get this committed down to audio? What's the process? So what would I have to do to get my MIDI information that we see here to show up as a waveform? Create a new audio track. We'll follow Ruben's path. I'll create a new stereo audio track. Now what do I do? How do I get the sound over there? Record arm the track. Route it through a bus. What bus? What bus should I use? Well, you can use any available bus. So if we look here on the input, notice here we've got any available bus. The ones I see in Amber are already used, so I don't want to use those. We'll use an available bus, 1780 sounds good. Now there's one step left out of the process. Uh, I hear a couple people saying sends. That's fine, but sends will actually create a copy of the signal. I want a direct signal. Send creates a copy. Yeah, output. So I want my output to be what? Yeah, the same bus. So the bus that I used for the input was 17 and 18, so the bus on the output needs to match. Bus 17 and 18. Excellent. Now all I have to do is just record myself. So we're going to go ahead and just take a, a quick pass and record this. Um, so this might take, well, it's going to take the length of the song. In fact, we won't see how long it's going to take us. We can look at our minutes and seconds. So I'll see you guys in about four and a half minutes because we're going to go ahead and record this piece down. Um, we'll show you the nice large waveform as it gets recorded, but we've got to commit this down to audio. So we'll see you back in about four and a half minutes. Now notice I'm not actually hearing it. I'm not hearing it because I have the original track soloed. So if I actually want to hear it being balanced at the same time, you'd want to solo that track as well.
Nice. Excellent. Well, now it's time that I usually would turn my attention towards my bass and my rhythm section. So we're going to kind of switch gears here. Now, you guys just saw me basically mimic out the bass piece. You basically want to do the same thing for the uh, background guitar, uh, the keys, and then the main guitar. Those are basically the only other sounds that you're going to have to probably go back and replace. So, um, again, you don't have to use the ex exact same notes. You saw me use their notes as a stepping off point, and then I went and changed it to be something a little bit more original, a little bit more synth-driven, a little bit more uh, maybe dance-based. But either way, you guys can basically put in whatever patterns you want, as long as they're complementing the key structure of the song. It, it's going to be totally up to you guys to do whatever it is you want to do. So let's actually uh, jump into the role of, uh, let's go ahead and rename these tracks. Once, let's do, uh, I'm going to call this MIDI bass. That way I know that that's the MIDI bass track, and of course this one's going to call bass. And truthfully guys, I probably should have named this track before I recorded it. And the reason why is the actual file name would have taken its name based off of the track name. So if I'd done that in advance, I wouldn't have to go back and rename that file. Okay, now here again is where I'm going to step off and start into going into some mixing because I want to make sure my bass and my kicks are sitting tight together. So we kind of need to audition these parts together. So first of all, let's get all the tracks showing. Let's take a look at the parts that we tracked out. Here's my kick and my snare and my hats. But these guys are going to have to be complementing up here with these loops. Remember I had some loops that I was using as well as my original parts. So I'm actually going to group these all together. Notice I have all the tracks highlighted. We're going to go ahead, go ahead and create an edit and a mix group. So now that they're all highlighted, Command G will allow me to create an edit and mix group. We're going to call it Percussion. Uh, there's some group attributes. We want it to be both a, a mix and edit group. We want it to follow volumes and mutes. We'll go ahead and hit OK. And you'll notice it shows up here in our groups list. That way if I go to select across any one of these, notice it's going to select across all of them because they're all grouped together. If I try to go and adjust volume levels, notice they all are now grouped together. Now this is going to be helpful here in a second. When I solo these all out, notice I can go and now listen. We'll get rid of our MIDI bass. We don't need it here anymore, so we'll just say hide and make it active. Because we want to basically listen to our percussion along with the bass. So let's take a listen. my kick is really getting eaten up by this uh, by this bass line and in fact I probably would want to go back and change this to be some other kick now notice that since they're all grouped if I want to turn up the kick it turns up everything so if I want to temporarily suspend this group but still be able to adjust that kick if you hold down command I'm sorry control notice I can then independently even though it's still grouped you can see it's grouped over here in the groups list I can now independently move this around so we can turn that way up um, it's still probably not going to punch through the mix because they're kind of in the same frequency. Our kick, it's almost in the same frequency as our bass line. In fact, if we were to uh, ungroup this and solo these out together so you could actually hear them individually, you're going to find that they kind of just really get in each other's way. Solo out the kick, bring in the bass. basically in the same exact frequency. So uh, if not, they're so close together that they're, they're starting to fight for space in the mix itself. So here is where I'd probably go and actually find some other kick. Let's go and take a look at the kick that we have. We already have a nice pattern here laid out. However, I think we're going to have to change this up slightly. Let's go back to the beginning here. Nice kick pattern, and, but it looks like it's going to be an 808 kick and it's just not punching through the mix. So here's where I might want to actually go try to import another kick and replace that kick to uh, find something that would, might be punchier. Uh, for right now, just for demonstration purposes, we're going to go ahead and leave the kick. Um, but if I wanted to, I could go back through that library that you guys saw earlier. So if we go back through, let's see here. Remember, our library is the library of work that you got off your Avid DigiDesign account. And so it's eight and a half gigs worth of loop libraries. If you go back through this loop libraries, we'll go through, uh, find the dance DJ, 
If we go and look under percussion, notice here we've got all kinds of different instruments. Let's look at miscellaneous percussion. And I'm looking for just a straight up kick. Looks like these are all percussion loops. Let's go back. Clap, dance, percussion. Let's go back till I find something that's just an individual hit. Here we go, here's kicks. You can see I've got several different kicks here. I'm just gonna audition them. This actually wasn't a bad kick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this in here. Let's take a look. I'm going to pull out one of these kicks and basically just replace my kick with this kick. It's a much punchier kick. So it's got a lot more mid-range to it. Uh, I've already got it dropped in the track here. Let's solo it out. <clears throat> and let's go find one individual kick and just basically replace my kick with that kick. Uh, we could actually just grab the very first one if we want. There's my very first kick. We'll go ahead and change my grid, bars and beats, get myself to like 16th notes, and there we can just edit out the individual kick. Command T to trim it and keep the selection, and now I just basically go put that kick wherever I see the old kick. See, I've got one there, I've got one there. I'm just option dragging uh, basically to copy this pattern. And by the way, I'm not even sure this is really going to work. We're just going to try it out. I'm just following along with the original pattern that I created and just creating a new pattern using a new kick. I can also, if I wanted to, even blend the, these two together. Oops, missed that one. Option drag. Sometimes mixing kicks together or bass lines is a good thing. Sometimes it's bad. We're going to find out here real quick. So I'm only going to do this for uh, a couple bars here because I believe the pattern pretty much just repeats itself throughout the song. So we won't have to do this much longer. Let's go to just a couple more bars here. All right. Now, I think the pattern pretty much repeats itself. Double kick there, double kick. Yeah, it really does. So if we go ahead and just make a selection in one bar increments, I could then consolidate this because we now have the same pattern. Shift option three consolidates it. Duplicate it out. There, I've got the same pattern throughout the entire song now. Let's listen to these two kicks just mixed together, and then we'll add the bass. This may sound good, it may sound bad. I have no way of knowing until I try it out. That doesn't sound bad. Let's see what it sounds like with the rest of the percussion. We'll go ahead and we'll turn the group back on. Punchier. I'm definitely hearing that punch through the mix. So we don't really need that original kick anymore. In fact, there's our fitting frequencies. They're, they're both kind of in the same exact range. I'm going to go ahead and save my work. We're going to delete this track. Or we'll just hide it and make it active for right now. And then what I basically need to do is I need to modify this group that I created for my percussion group. We could always delete the group and recreate it, or we could actually modify the group. So notice it's asking us to modify. Because I actually notice I, I don't have that original kick. Let's get rid of that one. And then what was the track name? We're going to have to go back and name this track, but it's basically this track, Techno Kick. So it's now part of that group again. That way when I go to solo out pieces, it actually gets soloed with it as well. Excellent. Let's actually listen to it with the bass line. Excellent. Yeah, it's much tighter. You can hear it's punching through the mix. It's it's a basically it's a slightly higher frequency bass. I'm sorry, kick drum, and so it's not fighting with the bass as much anymore.
now you guys probably can't hear this at home, but we're starting to have something happen in the situation here to where we're actually starting to distort, but we can't see the distortion because we actually don't have a master fader. Let's go ahead and create that master fader now. Stereo, master fader. Now, I have a feeling I've been overdriving this this whole time, but since this meter hasn't been there, we have no way of knowing. I can hear it here on my end because it sounds like it's clipping, but let's go ahead and take a listen. Wow, actually, I'm not clipping. It sounded like I was earlier, but I'm not clipping right now. Now, a master fader is going to be important because without having a master fader, you really can't see your overall level for output. So you're going to want to make sure you have a master fader. Since we're dealing with master fader, let's go ahead and talk about some, some more mixing features. Notice here in the mix window, everything's starting to look really similar. In fact, all the tracks are gray. They're all gray, and the only way of knowing one track from the other is if you look at these little symbols here at the bottom. That's a little waveform that lets me know that I'm dealing with an audio track. We see this little arrow symbol that lets me know I'm dealing with an aux track. We see we have a sigma symbol for summation, so I know I'm dealing with a master fader track. These are all important symbols, but we could also make our tracks stand out a little bit if we also gave them some colors. So I'm going to select all the colors here that are dealing with the percussive pieces that I was dealing with earlier, and let's actually give them a color. Underneath your Windows menu, you want to go to Color Palette. And under Color Palette, you can really change it to whatever color you want. But notice here it says it's uh, already set up for clips and tracks. We actually want to do it for the tracks themselves. And then you can make it whatever color you want. I'm going to go ahead and make mine brown. And then let's actually give it some saturation. Uh, the tracks themselves didn't change colors. Hang on a second. Not sure why they didn't change colors. Tracks. Brightness. Ooh, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, let's take a look at our, our uh, edit window. All right, I think I see what's happening here. The tracks themselves actually are changing the color, but we're not able to see it because if we look here, it's not actually being viewed. It's not being viewed because in our mix window, you need to say track color. All right, cool. So any of the tracks that we want to have color, we're going to need to basically select the tracks that you want to be a specific color and then change that color. Uh, notice right now, the reason all tracks change color is because I'm actually holding some extra key commands that you guys can't see. So let me let go of those. Okay. So notice here, whatever tracks you have highlighted, you just basically select the color that you want them to be, and they're going to turn that color. So that lets you see the tracks as being a different color, and then you can adjust the saturation. So I'm going to go ahead and make mine brown for right now. You can change yours to be whatever color you want. I typically am going to make vocals yellow because vocals are very important to me. So vocals, that makes them stand out. I can see the vocal I'm going to put it at the very top of my track. Uh, I usually like my percussion to be right next to my bass because those are the two things that are going to basically fight with the most because there's a lot of low-end content dealing with the kick drum versus the bass. So it's something you want to be aware of, especially with rock tunes. Um, that that uh, kick drum is going to need to be able to punch through the mix. A lot of times the bass is going to be in the same frequency, so you're going to have to find creative ways of making them stick out. Sometimes even on rock tracks, they'll go through and they'll do drum replacements similar to what you just saw me do to uh, help the track out and to get it to punch a little bit better. Now let's <clears throat> switch gears and I want to talk a little bit about time-based routing. Notice I talked a little bit and I touched on colors. You guys are going to want to go a little bit more in depth with your colors. I'm just trying to show you different ways of making your mix stand out. That way when you go to mix it, you can see what parts are what based off a of color. To me, it really kind of helps see things visually, just like you saw me kind of pasting out notes visually. I work in the same method. I like to always see things kind of visually. It helps my eye go directly to where all my percussive pieces are because I see that they are the same color scheme. Okay, time-based routing. I want to actually demonstrate this, but I want to show it to you with the vocals because I think it'll be most impressive with the vocals. So let's hide all tracks except for that box track, which we put at the top, and let's talk about time-based routing. So time-based routing is really going to deal with your reverbs and delays. Time-based routing means that the, the effect itself is not put directly on the track. It's actually going to be put on an aux track. So let's create a stereo aux track. Stereo aux. Let's name this reverb. Or you can shorten it to just verb if you want. 
let's put a reverb plugin on this track. We'll use a reverb plugin that you all have. We'll use Dverb. Now you've got some settings here. I know it's going to be a vocal track, so I'm going to set it up for a plate. But now to actually get the sound to show up on the aux track, this is where you're going to create a send. And your send, you can use any available bus. I'll use bus 1 and 2. Just make sure the input for your aux track matches. Bus 1 and 2. Excellent. Now to get the sound to actually show up, notice the send itself showed a floating output send window, which is this window right here. This window is basically showing us the amount of effect. Once I turn this up, it'll be the amount of the effect that's being sent over to this reverb. So I'm going to solo this track, but when I solo it, it's going to give me a problem because I'm not going to hear reverb even if I have it turned up. So to make sure I can hear it, I'm going to do what's called solo safing. Uh, command click. Notice the solo button is grayed out. That way, when we start playing vocals back, let me hide a couple pieces or get them out of the way a little bit. When we start playing this back, you're going to hear the vocals because I have the track solo saved. Interesting, my tracks aren't resizing. Oh, that says vocal effects. Let's actually get the main vocals. Uh, lead vocals. Make lead vocals yellow as well. So I'm just going to select both these tracks. That way we have the same color scheme going on. So Windows Color Palette. I like my vocals to be yellow. There you go. And you can actually just copy this bus. So Option drag it. And we'll be dealing with this bus path. So just to keep things basic, I'm going to hide this uh, second vocal effects track so we can keep things kind of simple for right now. So I kind of just want you guys to understand the concept first. So notice the track is solo saved. We'll solo this track. We'll take a look, get some vocals set up here for us. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and start playing some vocals. Looks like Pro Tools is giving me a hard time. Interesting. There was in no one speaks about the night before. She stares off at the road, her finger taps the door. I'd hate to judge if you're the bus. So you can you think so too. So you can see the amount that we turn up our send is the amount of the vocal effect that the copied signal that's going to be sent over to the aux track. Uh, Ruben is asking what we want to put, pull the reverb off that uh, vocal effects track. I, I'm not sure. I'm not going to really pay attention to the vocal effects track right now. I just want to show you guys the concept of what it is that we're going to do, first of all. So I have a reverb set up. We're hearing this track dry. So you're hearing the output of this dry track here, as well as the copied signal going over to the input here. Excellent. Uh, so now when we turn up the send... Not really sure why I'm having to play this from my screen here. My spacebar is not working any longer. The words that no one speaks about the night before. She stares off at the road. Her finger taps the door. Now we basically just added the sound of a room behind his vocals, which kind of gives it that that uh, polish sheen sound that you're used to hearing on the radio. But it's really just adding reverberation to the vocals. Now, um, it's really common to do this with vocals as well as other instruments as well. And the cool thing about setting it up the way we just did is if you take a look, because I set this up on a send, any of my tracks can actually utilize the same reverb. You just have to create a send on the track. So if I wanted that reverb to be on my snare, I would just send the snare out of the same bus, bus one and two. Now, if we were to play the snare back, you'd actually hear the snare with reverb on it as well. Another cool effect I want to show you is I want to talk about some automation as well as using your time-based effects. Let's hide all tracks except for the vocal track again. And I'm really not sure why Pro Tools is not letting me play. Let me try something real quick. There we go. Cool. Um, sometimes when you have the graphics up of some plugins, like when I had that reverb up, I, was, some, I noticed that a small bug with Pro Tools is sometimes the spacebar feature will, will stop working. So I just hit all the windows, and now my spacebar is back. But uh, just kind of explain to you what, what just happened. Let's pull up that reverb track. 
because um, we're basically going to follow the same pattern. So for this time, I'm going to use an automated delay. So we're going to do a time-based effect to the vocals, but using a delay with automation. So let's create a stereo aux track. Excellent. Let's call this delay. Let's put a delay plugin on the track itself. Delay. I'm going to use extra long delay. I'll set one side of the delay to be a whole note. The other side will be a half note. Now you'll need to turn up the feedback. If you don't, you only hear the delay happen one time. And I'm also going to change the low pass filter slightly. This will make the delay as it falls away. It'll actually start to take off some of the high end, which is how natural delays actually sound. The high end will dissipate first. So I'll give it a little bit more of a natural feel. Again, you'll want to turn up the feedback so you can hear the delay. Now it's time to put the automation features in. So we've got to route it first. Let's set it up for bus three and four. We'll create a send on bus three and four. And basically what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go find a word at the end of a verse and we're going to put a delay on the very last word. So probably either coming out of the chorus or coming out of a verse. I think coming out of the chorus is going to be better and I'll show you why here. If I look at the, the actual chorus section here, there's a big break here which would make a nice section for, for a word to delay away. If you've ever been at a concert and you hear the very last word, 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 delay away, that's basically the effect we're going to do, but we're going to automate it. So let's go and listen to what the last word is that we can see here before it fades away here. Let's take a listen. You're passing races with mine and I swear we can take the world. So it sounds like there's already a little bit of delay on there, but the last word is world. So basically I want to go in and find where the last W for world starts. I think it's going to be somewhere right about here. You, you can kind of look just based off of the waveform and see that's right about where the word world comes in. In fact, let's hit play, just audition it. The world! Well, there's the, and then I think world will be here. The world! Yeah, so here's world. So that's the word that we actually want to add more delay to. So what do we do? We're actually going to automate the send level on that delay. So instead of looking at the waveform, we want to look at the bus three and four and look at its level. Now that we see that bus is level, we want to create some automation breakpoints and actually turn that up for that section. Let's zoom in and see how this works. Basically just created several automation breakpoints. I'm going to take it up to, that's a little high, 3 dB up, but let's just leave it there and see what it sounds like. And I'm going to actually, hopefully this delay will carry on for quite a bit here because I created a whole note delay. And you can see we've got a long section here before the next word comes in. So let's pull up that send so you can see it automate. And let's make sure we solo safe our aux track. And let's take a listen to the uh, automation for that delayed last word. You're going to hear world, world, world continue on. Your pulse races with mine, and I swear we can take the world, world, world. Wild. Wild. Hand against her cheek. So go ahead and listen. It's now in time with the song as well because it's in a perfect position. In fact, you can still hear that delay going on in the background. Now, if we listen to the overall effect mixed into a song, you'll hear that, that delay is going to fall right in time with the song itself. So let's go back and actually listen to it. Turn this down just a little bit. All right, cool. So you've just seen automation, and you can still hear the delay going on in the background. It sounds like I might want to bring down that original whole note. 66% uh, might be a little bit long, so we could bring it down. That way it's not continuing throughout the song. But there you go. You've seen now automation happen in real time as well. Now, it's about time for us to show you some session delivery formats. Now, some things that we went over today. We showed you how to create um, MIDI information, record your MIDI down to audio. 
We've dealt with time-based effects and showing you how to route your time-based effects. We've also shown you automation inside of Pro Tools and how to get your automation to work. Uh, can we automate cutoffs on delays? Yeah, and basically anything, take a look here. Let me go back to the plugin here. Let me show you some things you can automate. Now, there's a couple of different ways I could have done some automation. Um, you saw me draw in automation here, which is super, super accurate. And nine times out of 10, that's the way I'm gonna do it. But we could have also automated a feature just by going underneath the auto button that you see here on the plugin. And notice this shows me every single thing that you could automate dealing with that plugin. So you see I have the master bypass, input left, to invert left, uh, mix left, low pass frequency left, delay left, depth left, rate left, feedback left, tempo, tempo sync, meter number. So we can actually change the tempo of the delay as it's happening as well. A lot of really cool features. Yeah, so the, the, the automation side of Pro Tools is one of the hidden gems that a lot of people tend to overlook. There's so much power to just the automation alone. Now, I showed you this with this particular plugin, but imagine this with a plugin uh, like Velvet, or I'm sorry, like um, Vacuum. Let me pull up Vacuum again real quick and show you some other features of that. Remember earlier, we had the uh, baseline, we had it as MIDI. I'm going to just pull out of here real quick. And I believe I hit it. I hit it from view because we weren't really dealing with it anymore. Let's take a look. Here's that MIDI baseline. Um, remember, we already recorded it down as, as audio, but let's suppose maybe we weren't really happy with the results and we wanted to try something to, to give it um, a different punch, different feel. Well, we already have the pattern. And here's a good example of where we could also have added some automation into the cutoff of that original plugin. What do I mean by that? Well, let me hide everything except for the baseline that we're currently using. Awesome. So there's the baseline that we're recording. We're going to mute that one and let's re engage this other one. All right. This other baseline we're going to use, uh, we'll just hide this one for right now. We muted it so we won't have to hear it. And for right now, we'll just hide it and make it inactive. Remember, this is the same bass sound that we were using that we recorded down as audio. But we inactivated the track, so let's reactivate this track. And remember, we're using expand. And we were adjusting cutoff before, and that kind of gave it some really cool vibe. In fact, we listened, we'll solo it out, listen to it. Oh yeah, we need to route the output because we recorded it to audio, so it needs to go out to outputs one and two. So let's say we actually want to automate that feature. Well, we could go up to the auto button here, but notice this. This list gets really long. This is where using virtual instruments inside of Pro Tools and using the automation, this is where it really starts to take off. Uh, because look, look at all the control you have over all the different parameters here. Well, I see I've got cut off there, but let's just say I didn't want to go through this list and find that particular knob. If you hold down uh, Control, Option, and Command, all three keys, and you click here, notice it says Enable Automation for Cutoff. And in fact, if we go back to the automation knob, I'm sorry, the automation uh, parameters that you can automate, you'll notice that it added Cutoff to that list. So we can add Attack, Decay, or you can take those away as well. But anytime you add any of these features, you double click it, it goes over here, you're now making that automated, or you can select it and choose Add, but double clicking basically does the same thing. So now with that said, I can go back and automate this particular feature throughout the song. I can actually uh, just dial it in with my mouse. And if I had a controller, a controller, <coughs> pardon me, something like a, an actual icon or a 002 or 003, you can assign these to physical knobs on your, uh, on your controller. So if you've got, uh, oh, I don't know, again, a 002 or 003 control service will allow you then to, to, uh, basically map this to a, a specific knob. But if you wanted to, we could just go ahead and just adjust it here as well. The only thing you'd have to do is go ahead and right now, notice it's an automation read. You want to set this for right. And now I don't even have to record on the track. I'm just going to go ahead and hit play. And because the automation is set for right, it's going to know that I'm recording this information. So I'll go ahead and we'll hit play and we'll adjust this feature here.
So I just uh, recorded in some automation. Let's go ahead and we'll set it to read that automation. Read, hit play. So you can see the knob's actually moving now. That's under the power of automation. So you're saying, well, where's the automation lane? We're looking at the MIDI information here on this track, and this MIDI information is now triggering this virtual instrument. And then this virtual instrument is under the command of our automation. So we no longer want to look at the clips. We actually want to look at the automation that we just wrote in. Notice here, any of the uh, automation features that you've added will be down at the bottom. So there's our cutoff. We take a look. There's all the knob movements that you just saw me create. Now, all these knob movements, we can also then copy and paste, Command C, Command V, or we can take these and actually bring them up or down. So all these different automation features, it really makes Pro Tools very, very powerful. And yeah, we're now taking a virtual instrument, something that's inside the computer. Let me get this back here, bring up the old expand. And we're now giving it a lot of power for control under uh, guidance of, of our automation. Awesome, cool. Yeah, any of you that actually need to leave the class, it's okay. This uh, will be up as an archive. It'll be up in your announcement section. I see some of you had to take off. Not a big deal. Um, yeah, automation is going to be really, really, really cool, and it's going to be one of the features that you guys are going to have to do on your project. So, by the way, every single plugin, like, take a look at this. All right. Um, let's get rid of our MIDI base here. I was just giving you some examples here for automation. This, this is where Pro Tools really kind of kicks into gear. Let's uh, hide it and make it inactive again. Let's pull up our original baseline because even though we recorded it down to audio, there's still some features we could actually do to it that are similar. So if we pull up our base, show our base, this is the one that we recorded down. Let's activate it again, make active. Let's say that we pull up a plugin. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll pick a really simple EQ plugin. We'll say a one band EQ. Now, we all, all can see that I've already recorded the uh, bass line here. We could solo it out and listen to it. We could also control some of the features of this bass as well. Notice if I set up for a low pass, we could then sweep this. Notice I'm just sweeping the frequency. Um, or we could set it up to be a high pass, similar So we're just cutting off frequencies there. So notice that any of your plugins, in fact, let's jump this to a larger plugin. We'll do a seven band EQ. Seven band EQ basically just gives us more bands to adjust. Uh, and again, I'm probably gonna just do the same thing. We'll create a high pass. I'll just sweep basically the frequency here. So if I wanna make this automatable, I'm going to hold down Control, Option, Command, all three keys right next to your space bar, click on the particular knob that you want under Command, and say Enable Automation for High Pass Frequency. Now you'll notice that basically did the same thing as going into this list, and look at this list. Again, it's a large EQ with a lot of knobs, so every single one of those knobs you can automate, and you can see that I just made the High Pass Frequency automatable. Okay, uh, now that I have that knob automatable, now all I have to do is put the track into write mode instead of read. It's really, really simple. Hit play. Notice I'm not, I don't even have the track recorder on. Just hit play and adjust the knob. So again, the knob that I was going to adjust would be this frequency right here. So. Okay, stop playback. We'll put it into read mode. Hit play. You'll notice that knob is now going to be under automation control. Okay, cool. Now notice that I don't see the automation lane. That's because we're still viewing the waveform from this track, but since the plugin is on that track, just change the actual playlist view from, ball, uh, from waveform down to the high pass frequency, and there's all the automation that you just saw me uh, basically just mouse it in with the knob by adjusting the knob here. So the automation inside of Pro Tools is really, really tight. It's actually really, really easy to, and uh, very, very accurate, and very, very, Potent, very, very cool features. 
So a couple of things that we need to nail down. We've now got in automation as well as time-based routing. Um, we showed you reverbs and delays. We also showed you using MIDI information and getting it recorded down to audio. It's now time to show you guys a little bit about how I want you to prepare the session for delivery. So for delivery, what I need you to do is take a look at your session. Let's actually show all tracks. And anytime there's a lot of dead space in a song, you want to get rid of the dead space. So let's take a look at our song. Number one, you can double click the uh, magnifying glass, which will basically show your entire session up to the end of the session. You can make the tracks a little bit larger. So it looks like here, especially on this vocal effects track, I don't need all that dead space. This is where uh, a lot of, I'm basically kind of showing you guys where most students mess up uh, and where you guys, most students will lose points. Most students are going to lose points because they have things that in their regions list that are no longer in use. For instance, uh, you guys have seen me whittle away at this song. And of course, if I were really turning this in, my project would not be done. There'd be some other things we'd want to continue on with. But for the sake of time, and so we can get some last minute questions in, I just kind of wanted to show you guys a wrap up and how we need you guys to deliver this. First of all, since I did a bunch of little edits, there's a bunch of little pieces, parts I don't need anymore. In fact, there's also unnamed audio files. Big no-no. You don't ever want to have unnamed audio. For right now, I'm not going to worry about these unnamed audio pieces, and I'll show you why. They're probably going to go away here in a little bit. But uh, what I'm noticing is I have a bunch of dead space on some of my vocal pieces. For instance, let me change all tracks to be uh, waveform. Cool. So notice here on my top two tracks, lots of dead air. You don't want to have dead air. Um, what do I mean by that? Let's put this back down into one bar increments. There's a big lead in to the beginning of the song. I don't need all this dead air. You're sending me megabytes and megabytes worth of information that is useless. There's also a big piece at the very end of the song. We don't need that either. For this vocal effects, there's nothing going on to almost the end of the song. You don't need to have a big piece of waveform. Now, just because I trim this information down doesn't mean that we actually are getting rid of space. That actually just means we've trimmed off the beginning and end points, but the actual audio files are actually still taking up all that space. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Everything else looks like it's not really, there's not a whole lot of dead air. And eh, maybe in a couple spots here. We can get rid of some of this dead air here. There's a little bit going on in here. I'll go ahead and trim it. And maybe a little bit at the end of the song there. A little bit going on here. We'll just get rid of it, just delete it. A little bit happening at the very beginning. And a little bit at the tail of the song too. Tail end right here, grab the trim tool and just trim it away. Now notice I put myself on one bar increments, that way I, it was it was kind of real easy for me to, not to overshoot and to trim into vocal pieces that we're gonna need. So we got rid of a lot of the dead air. There's some there as well. Just continue down. Looks like we got rid of all the dead air. However, I wanna show you something here. The, the session size has not changed at all. Whenever I trimmed away this beginning piece, we just changed the set of pointers that pointed to the beginning location of the file. We said, no, the beginning now starts here. But you can see that information is still there. It's not really gone because we're in a non-destructive editing uh, operation. So basically, we didn't reduce the size of our session at all. In fact, if we hide the Pro Tools session and actually go look at the session file size, it's going to be the same exact size. Let's go take a look at it. Uh, where is it at? It is She Wants Revenge. Here's the name of the song. Actually, I tell you what, it's back here in our music folder, Pro Tools folder. It's called She Wants Revenge, Take the World. That's the session right there. Command I will show us file size information about the session. It shows us here that it's 765 megabytes, which you already know is not going to fit on FSO. That means you guys are going to have to use Dropbox and send me a Dropbox link to FSO via a text document or a Word document or a Pages document. Please do not email it to me. Make sure you post it to FSO before the deadline. However, I don't need you to send me the entire session because this has a bunch of junk in it we don't need. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to the Pro Tools session. Whenever I trim these regions down, it really didn't get rid of information. It really just basically changed the beginning and end pointers. There's also a lot of pieces here in my regions list that aren't in use in the session. Shift Command U is going to select any unused portions. Now you saw me just use a quick key. Notice all the stuff that's highlighted in gray. We don't need that. That's all junk. It can go away. 
it's not in use in the session anymore. So remember some of the files I said that weren't named? A bunch of those are included as well. So no need to rename those. We're about to get rid of them. Now let me show you what I just did but without using the quick key. Basically, I went over to my regions list. I did Shift Command U was the quick key, but the same feature you saw me do, you can use under select, and then you have unuse. Notice the quick key, oops, is Shift Command U. And there you go, it selects all the unused portions. Shift Command B, or we'll just cancel this for a moment. Now that I have the unused portions, everything you see here in gray in my regions list, if you go under clear, Shift Command B, you have two options. You have remove or delete. Remove will remove them from the regions list. However, they will still be in the audio files folder, which will basically leave your session the same size. Be careful with delete because delete is an undoable feature. So before I choose delete, which is what you want to do to get rid of these, we're going to go ahead and do save copy in. So let's do cancel, file, save session copy in, which will create an effective archive. Check off all audio files. Very, very important feature. And let's save this back to the desktop. Save it to my desktop. I don't want the word copy of in there. There she wants revenge. And by the way, you're going to want to put your name in your file as well. So Barry, B-E-R-R-Y. And underscore John. And we'll save this back to the desktop. Now, when I do this feature, notice what happens. We'll do save. It's going to copy all the audio files. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to make sure I have a safety backup. The archive that you're going to want to send me is basically what you're seeing that's being copied right now. The difference in this procedure is whenever you do a save as, it puts you back into the brand new session. Whenever you do save copy in, it's going to leave us in this old session, version 7. That's not the version we want to be in. We want to be in the new save copy in. So we're going to have to close the session and go open up that new one. Give it a moment while the files actually copy over. <clears throat> so this process, just depending on your file size, is going to take a little bit. Uh, just waiting for the files to copy. All right, now remember, once the files are copied over, we're still in the old session. So if I want to get my new archive, we're going to have to close the session and go back to the new one. Remember, I put my name before the session, so you notice here at the very top, we're still in the old session. Let's close this, Shift-Command-W, don't save it. You can actually navigate back to my desktop. Hide Pro Tools for a quick minute. There it is. There's that session that we want to open. This is the archive session, but if we notice, it's going to be the same file size because I haven't really shrunk it down yet. Command-I. Yeah, still 750 megabytes. Let's open this one up. This is going to be basically what you're going to send to me as a delivery. So notice we've got the audio files, which is going to be important. You need to have inside of your session folder, so you've got your session folder. We'll open that up. You have a session file, and you'll need the attributed audio files as well. So go ahead and launch the session. And we're going to shrink the file size down, and then we'll open it up for questions for you guys. So notice it's a direct copy. It's got a, a new set of audio files, but we still need to get rid of all the extraneous stuff here that I don't need you guys to send me. Shift-Command-U selects the unused. Shift-Command-B, and then we're going to delete all these files. Excellent. All the files are gone. Notice here, basically, everything's already named, so I don't really have to worry, eh, except for some, some MIDI piece, pieces parts. So you'll probably want to go back and name those. Um... But let's go back and actually look at the, the session file size, because you're going to see it shrunk down considerably. So here is that session, Command-I, oops, Command-I. Oop, hang on a second. We're looking at the wrong folder here. Select the session folder, Command-I. There you go, 555 megabytes as opposed to 750 megabytes. So really, really big difference in file size. Now, before you post this up to Dropbox, you'll want to actually zip it or archive it, compress, and that's basically it. That's what you guys are going to post up to Dropbox, and then make sure that uh, you guys post this up to the, the, the actual downloadable link. Make sure that makes it up to FSO before the actual deadline.
All right, so here's what I'm going to open up to questions from you guys. We've gone over quite a bit today. We've shown a lot about session organization and how to color your tracks, time-based routing, converting MIDI to audio, automation side of Pro Tools, um, and basically session preparation for delivery and archive. So how about some questions? Any questions from you guys? Uh, yeah, there's a couple things that I, I didn't really have enough time to take you through and show you, but uh, if we were to go back to the session, we are asking that you guys actually put a dither plug-in on the master fader, and I also didn't show you guys setting up audio subgroups. Unfortunately, we just didn't have time for tonight. Make sure you guys catch audio subgroups in the lecture portion. If I had to give you a quick example of what an audio subgroup is, we'll go ahead and show you with the percussion pieces. I'll control click on my percussion. Notice that if I control click it and it's already a group, it's going to show me just the members of that group. If I want to create an audio subgroup, we go ahead and create a stereo aux input track. And this aux input track will set it up to be a bus. Whatever the bus input is, bus 35 and 36, is what you want to have happen for all the outputs of our percussion group. Bus 35 and 36 is what we use. So now basically, this is an audio subgroup for all my percussion. We'll go ahead and call this perk for percussion. In fact, we'll call it, let's call it perk sub. That way I know what it is, percussion subgroup. So now if I actually want to turn down the drums, all I have to do is turn down one track. So now basically this is considered an audio subgroup. It's controlling all the outputs for all my members. These members are already pretty well mixed in their own right. We'll go ahead and set up some pan positions for them as well. Let's see, I like my kicks to be right up the middle. I don't usually leave things hard pan left and right. And so since they're already panned on their own in, in introspective tracks, you don't have to do any panning on the actual audio subgroup because these are basically already pre-mixed and just being under control of the audio subgroup. Good questions. Some more questions. Okay, good question. What does Dither do? Uh, dither is low-level noise added to a signal to help uh, alter quantization error. There's some big words there that I used, and that's from your digital audio and theory course. What is quantization error? So the term that I just gave to low-level noise added to counteract quantization error Without actually showing you some, some uh, big pie graph and showing you a bunch of graphics, basically quantization error is the rounding up or down to the next uh, interval that you have um, when you're quantifying a piece of audio. So whether it's 16-bit or 24-bit, you're going to have a different set of quantization intervals that's basically rounding up or down. That actually creates an error, and that error at some point will be lost once we truncate from 24-bit down to 16-bit. This is where dither comes into play to help bump that bit up from being a least significant bit to a more important bit, which will be kept. So basically, to put it into real simple terms, whenever you're taking a 24-bit file and you're truncating down to 16 bits, you're throwing away information. Some of that information you're going to want to keep, those least significant bits, you want to have them bump up and be considered a significant bit, and that's what dither does. So dither is basically going to be added to your master fader. We go find our master fader. We see it's right here. Excellent. Add dither as the very last plugin. Multi-channel. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to remember which of my plugins actually has dither on it. I've got several plugins that actually have dither on it. Uh, Maxim is a good one. It already has dither engaged on it. Uh, let's see here. Noise shaping right there. And dither, just turn it on. Cool. Other questions? Excellent questions so far.
Um, good question on Maxim. I tell you what, I'm not really a big. I know you guys saw me use Maxim. I'm really not a huge super fan of it, and I'll show you why. When I start using Maxim, it actually adds a lot of degradation to the signal. I showed it as an example. I would probably just pull up uh, anything other than Maxim. Let me show you why I don't like Maxim. We'll go ahead and we'll play this back. I'm actually going to set my threshold to uh, just right under zero dB. And when I start pulling down the ceiling, you guys are going to hear some distortion happen pretty quickly to the signal. We'll go ahead and just play the session back. Um, I'm not sure if this will translate, but you'll see it. Uh, and then eventually you'll hear it. <laughs> So maximum, as soon as you start using maximum, in fact, here's my ceiling. I set the wrong side. Uh, once you start adjusting the threshold, anything above 3 dB, it just starts distorting. So you can see here um, negative 6 dB, which means it's squashing the peak signal. Anything that's uh, above is getting squashed down now 6 dB. And it's already just adding so much trash to the sound that to me, it's I don't think this is a very effective plugin. It's not something I typically use, but just showing you a plugin that actually has dither applied. Oh yeah, you're right. There is a dither. Thank you for pointing that out. So if I want to change up here and switch out plugins, so the maxim dither. Thank you. And there's just your generic standard dither. I would actually probably probably rather you guys use that than maximum. Yeah, maximum is going to make it louder, but louder is not always good. You heard a lot of distortion. It did get louder, but it also really squashed the signal. And it took away a lot of the clarity. It probably didn't translate very well through the small microphone that you guys are listening to, but if you were here in this room, you would have heard it. It's pretty nasty. Good questions. Keep them coming. Um, I'll be honest with you. The stock stuff that's inside of Pro Tools is all right. I would probably normally step out of the stock stuff. Uh, there's a question here. What other stock Pro Tools plugins would you recommend for mastering? Um, the only other thing I'd probably use is I don't mind their EQ. Their EQs are pretty decent. Uh, typically, I'm not going to boost with an EQ. I'm going to cut with an EQ. But most of the stuff I'm going to use for mastering, I don't use the Pro Tools plugins, other than maybe the dither, some EQ, light compression. Um, there is a plugin that I would recommend, but again, you, you guys don't have to go out and spend your money. I have this thing called the gate. I'm sorry, the glue. Where is it at here? This guy's only 100 bucks, but it basically emulates an SSL bus compressor, and it does it really, really faithfully. It basically kind of glues the sound together. An SSL is basically an analog console. Um, it's a British console. And the actual bus compressor would actually make the sounds all kind of glue together. So that's why the plugin's called the glue. It's basically simply a compressor, but it kind of gives that uh, analog sound basically through plugin. Most compressors that are going to be a plug-in are not going to give you kind of artifacts or coloration to the sound. This actually does. It colors the sound as opposed to just giving you threshold features. Any other questions? Well, Coolio guys, we're about to wrap it up. I, I appreciate you guys coming out this evening, hanging out. I hope this was informative. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do with these compositions. Ruben is asking, after we lock in the grid, do we have to change anything else? As far as the tempo goes, no. I mean, I just want you guys to basically have the session locked up. Once you saw the session was locked up, it was easy once I uh, stenciled out where the sections of the song were, then to just take pieces and slide them over to where they need to be throughout the song. Especially today when you guys saw me creating this bass line. When I had the bass line, when I was creating all those MIDI parts, and I could actually see the structure of the song, it helped me basically to figure out how to lay out where these pieces parts go. So once you actually have the tempo of the song, the tempo is gonna help you lock down the grid, and the grid's gonna basically allow you to work inside of Pro Tools utilizing Pro Tools Grid. Excellent, guys. I appreciate you guys coming and hanging out tonight. I look forward to seeing your compositions, and good luck on this final project. I hope you guys have a good time with it. Good night, guys.